Good morning. Welcome to Alberta's Energy Future. This is the first session of the Emissions Reduction Alberta Spark Speaker Series presented in partnership with the University of Calgary. I'm Steve McDonald and I'm the CEO of Emissions Reduction Alberta. And I'm Marcia Nelson, uh, Executive Fellow with both the Haskane School of Business and the School of Public Policy at the University of Calgary. So welcome everyone and thanks for joining us. Today, we're excited to bring you the first of a three-part series of virtual sessions to talk about how Alberta can take a leadership role in creating a low carbon energy future for Canada and for the world. Today, and on June 23rd and June 30th, we'll be hosting 90-minute sessions from 9 to 10.30 a.m. Mountain Daylight Time. If you've not signed up for the next sessions, we really encourage you to do so. There's never been a more important time to reflect on the future. Alberta, Canada, and the world are making unprecedented decisions to help us survive the current challenges. But we also need to make decisions that will allow us to thrive in the long term. In this three-part series, we hope to have those conversations. Thought leaders will highlight the actions and opportunities to get Albertans back to work, to secure a long-term sustainable energy future. Each session will include a Q&A and the opportunity for virtual small groups discussions. We really encourage you to participate in the breakout rooms. This is where the creative collisions will occur and is, a, is as close as we can get to having those face-to-face -face interactions that we're all missing so much. As Steve said, we really want this to be interactive, to begin conversations and share perspectives, to, to start building a shared understanding of the energy future that Alberta needs to create. Coming out of this uh, set of events, we will be generating uh, what we heard report shaped by the input that we hear from all of you. So for our first session today, we're pleased to be welcoming Kathy Bardswick, CEO of the Canadian Institute for Climate Choices, and Al Reed, Executive Vice President, Stakeholder Engagement, Safety, Legal and General Counsel for Synovus Energy. For a candid discussion about the threats and opportunities of the current crisis and what a sustainable energy future and economic recovery looks like for Alberta. We're really looking forward to hearing their perspectives. And with that, we'd like to welcome Kathy and Al. So oh, thank you very much and good morning all. Um, so as you've heard, Al and I are here to basically kick off the first of these three sessions. And um, what we would like to do in, in the initial half hour is perhaps set the stage uh, associated with uh, some of the, the uh, Q&A and, and more importantly, uh, for the last part of this session, the interactions that we're hoping you will continue to join us with. Um, so let me start by saying um, that, that in my view, there is no question that we need dependable and affordable energy. And, and there is also no question, as we've already heard, that, that there is a growing global commitment to reduce carbon emissions, and, and to find a way to ensure that, that Canada finds its prosperous place in that journey. What is in question, and what Al and I will be spending some time with you on this morning, is now perhaps more acutely than ever, given both the challenges of oil prices and COVID, um, how will Alberta continue to play its historically critical role in providing energy leadership. What will that look like? What are the challenges that have to be overcome and what are the opportunities that we are so well positioned to leverage? So on that note, I'm going to ask Al to uh, kick off this morning with uh, some initial introductory comments. So over to you, Al, please. Thanks, Kathy, and, and good morning, everyone. I'm really happy to be here to talk on the, uh, on the panel today. I uh, want to thank the organizers and also everyone who's listening in for taking the time. Um, as the largest single contributor to Canada's gross domestic product, our country's energy sector needs to be strong and prosperous to help lead the post-pandemic economic recovery. Um, that will require Canada to implement policies to encourage investment in Canadian oil and gas operations, while also positioning our industry to be an integral part of a transition to a lower carbon energy future. Um, to do that, we first have to decouple production growth from emissions growth, 
And we believe we can achieve that at Synovus within the coming decade. And, and I'll talk a little bit about uh, one of the targets that we set um, as we go through this morning's program. Next, we need to continue driving down emissions by lowering the costs of low emissions extraction and carbon capture technologies. If we want to do this quickly, we need to work with government and we need to start doing that right away. Um, and I think there's some positive examples that have come out of the current crisis in terms of, 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 of government stepping up um, uh, that are really positive through programs like the support for methane reduction initiatives, which is, as, as everyone will know, methane is a particularly potent uh, greenhouse gas, um, and, and those are welcome, as well as the reclamation programs, the funding that's going to be there for orphaned wells. Um, that's positive. It will get people back to work. It'll get our industry uh, back uh, generating uh, cash flow and, and generating employment. The governments also need to incent the development of technology to address environmental challenges in our industry and especially GHG emissions. This can be done through um, funding partnerships to accelerate innovation and there's lots of examples of that. But also, and I think just as important, is policies that encourage um, technology development and uh, commercialization of those technologies. And it's, and it's important that the policies go through that whole spectrum um, that goes from invention to pilot to, to first commercial adoption to broad commercial adoption. And there's examples of where we've done that in the past that have worked particularly well. And I think those are some of the things that we can pull from today to meet this new challenge. Um, the other thing that I think is really important that maintaining Canada's competitiveness in the global market is also a key concern. The development and commercialization of emissions reduction and carbon capture technologies is expensive. Um, carbon capture and storage today is not economic on a broad scale. Um, and what that does is poses a significant barrier to Canadian companies when the vast majority of our international uh, competitors as oil producers are not facing those costs. And that's not a complaint, but the fact is that of the large oil producing jurisdictions in the world, Canada is the only one with a meaningful commitment to Paris and Canada is the only one with a price on carbon. Um, the other large producing jurisdictions which we compete with for market share don't have those uh, policies in place. Um, in Canada, provincial and federal governments and uh, industry need to work together to ensure our industry remains competitive um, so that we can maximize the value of the oil and gas that we produce. And that also has to happen while we're also reducing GHG emissions and establishing Canada as having a key role in the transition to a lower carbon future. And certainly that, when, 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 I, talk, when I talk to our federal government, I know that's something that they're very invested in. But individual companies also have a part to play. And Synovus, when we started in 2009, we, we were known um, right from the start as a sustainability leader. And we redoubled our efforts last year um, and really did uh, a, a lot of things that saw us uh, have the ability to release uh, four ESG targets at the beginning of this year. Um, and that was a result of, 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 a, of a six to nine months of work to make sure that they were tied to a business plan, make sure that, uh, that they were tied to what we wanted to also achieve as a company economically um, for all of our stakeholders. We plan to reach those targets by 2030. We've also set an aspiration of net zero emissions by 2050. And the difference between the target is it's tied to a business plan. And we know the levers that we can pull to get there. Um, a, a, an ambition is something that we would like to do, but today the technology that would allow us to do it is, is not commercial. That's my comments on making sure that we have the full spectrum uh, of policy in place. Ultimately, we're living in a world where, the wor where consumers want more energy, but they also want lower emissions. Um, with Canada's wealth of natural resources, it's, um, it's leading policy in, in energy and environment. There's no better place uh, for the world to look uh, for, uh, for, for hydrocarbon resources and hydrocarbon development than Canada. Um, but we need a unified energy vision uh, and the right policies to help us achieve that. And with that, I'll, I'll stop there. So Al, well, I, I, I want to pick up on, in fact, um, you know, some of the comments that you just made as you were closing your initial, um, your, your initial comments, and that is, around the uh, the journey that we are on. You've, you've referenced that Canada 
uh, has made commitments to 2030 and has uh, certainly uh, made additional commitments associated with 2050. Uh, we're certainly seeing that narrative uh, and the pace and the momentum of that narrative pick up globally, particularly in relation to now the challenges associated with, with post-COVID recovery. Um, but, but I think we all agree that there really isn't a shared vision, and, and you've mentioned that in your opening comments. What, what is that shared vision? What does that look like? What does a net zero 2050 for Canada look like? Um, and in fact, the, the institute that I'm associated with, Climate Choices, has a significant initiative underway as we speak to, to try to contribute to that clarity, to, to identifying what that can look like, what are the potential pathways for the country as we um, establish these targets, particularly in net zero 2050, but just as importantly, how we will achieve the 2030 targets that we've committed to. Um, but, but there's a, a lot of complexity and a lot of uncertainty in what those pathways look like, what the trade-offs are going to have to be, what the choices are going to have to be, and, and the decisions that we make as you've, as you've identified. And so when I think of the particular challenges for your industry, particularly oil and gas, and the need for you to look at investments, significant investment associated with maintaining your core capacity as an organization and, and your core infrastructure and your core product and service, and the significant investment as you have identified in your, in your opening comments and what that might look like, and then I layer that with um, more of the additional investment, uh, ancillary investment and, and investment associated with potential new opportunities like, you know, bitumen uh, in support of new product and service. And then even further afield, the uh, investments that you've referred to associated with, with new, um, you know, new sources, new biofuels and, and, the, and the role that hydrocarbons can play and the hydrogen markets and the positioning that we should be looking for as a country, that is a lot of complexity for an organization to sort through and be able to figure out how best to establish the priorities associated with the investments that are required. And again, particularly currently, given the, the uh, environment that we find ourselves in, how do you manage the complexity? I mean, how do you bring the clarity of thought to establishing those investment priorities? Uh, I, I think it, it starts with, it, you know, if you look at any, um, any energy forecast, there, there isn't an energy forecast that doesn't see hydrocarbons as continuing to have a meaningful role well into the future in meeting world energy demand. Um, there isn't uh, an, another, um, there isn't another uh, type of energy production that can compete with it for affordability, reliability, um, uh, portability, uh, all the things that you want in an energy source. Um, but at the same time, you're seeing developments of it, that are, that are in, improving the performance of other types of energy. And it, as, as the world adds somewhere between nine and close, I, I can't remember the exact numbers, but there's an incredible population growth between now and 2050. And, and everyone is going to need energy. So I, I think then you then you say, okay, well, we're in a world where there's going to be increased energy demand. Um, Canada um, has has uh, the fourth, the third largest oil reserves in the world, it's the, the third largest oil producer, and and also has incredible natural gas resources. How do we play in that future? And then as a company, how do you how do you see your part in that future? And and that was one of the things that we worked through. Um, uh, very carefully last year is, is how do we do all of this? And um, I, I think what, what we resolved to is, is we looked at, at what, our, what our opportunity is as a company, um, both to compete economically, um, be able to uh, continue to, to earn a return for our shareholders and make us an attractive place to invest, um, but also how do we meet our stakeholder needs? Um, and um, that's, a, that's a broad range of stakeholders, government, shareholders, um, uh, the people that lend us money, the institutions that lend us money. And so you have to factor all of that in. And what we saw is that we had the ability to reduce our GHG emissions between now and 2030 by a further 30%. We've already done that through technology and innovation. 
and we see ways that we can do that going forward and we've already started to action some of those things despite the the market that we're in um and then and then the, the the ambition was to say we think we can do this but we have to get some technologies that are going to work um and and to me uh canada's uh, if canada is going to be net zero the one that has to work is carbon capture and storage and there are other ones there are other technologies out there can you can you go to a lower carbon hydrogen production and things like that but carbon capture and storage is the one that I that I think really has to get working. It's a place that Canada had a natural advantage, and I think continues to have a natural advantage, but we've lost some of that. So a really good example is we used to own the Weyburn um, Enhanced Oil Recovery Facility, and it used to be the world's largest carbon capture and sequestration project. Um, and what we did, um, and, and this goes back to, uh, it goes back 20 years, over 20 years, um, that it was an old old oil field that was amenable to a COT flood that happened to be located um, proximate to a place where you could get CO2, uh, uh, a particularly pure form of CO2, so it wasn't expensive to capture, and then bring it up um, into the Weyburn facility and inject it for enhanced oil recovery. Um, we sequestered about 30 million tons over the 15 or so years that we operated that facility. Um, and I can't remember the exact numbers, but that's equivalent to taking a lot of cars off of, of the road for a year for inter, from an emissions perspective. We never received any credit for that. Um, and, if you, and ultimately, if you take a, a, a something that is economic and really discrete circumstances and you want broad application of that, you have to give people credit when they do that. So there's a, a really good example is there's a policy in the U.S. called 45Q. Um, that is that, is, that the Department of Energy asked for um, uh, some work on it. The work has been done. And really what it does is creates tax credits for companies that sequester, uh, that sequester carbon. Um, that's something that we don't have in, in Canada, but is an example of a policy that will be required um, if you want to get carbon capture and sequestration going because the barrier to entry is quite high. So, so let me also uh, pick up on, on something that you referenced uh, as well in terms of the innovations and the capacity and the, the competitive advantage that Canada has had historically in some respects. And, uh, and I'd, I'd like to ask you to, to comment on what are some pretty exciting opportunities and innovations that, um, that folks in Alberta um, have been addressing and turning their attention to. Uh, and, you know, I mean, the, the list is long, but um, I will um, just share, you know, when you look at the institutional capacity of the province, you've got some, some pretty exciting capacity, I think, that, that could well position us competitively when it comes to some of the new opportunities that exist. And I think about some of the work that Energy Futures Lab and, you know, the Transition Accelerator and work associated with Alberta Innovates, and the list goes on. The capacity of your academic thought leaders. Can, can you, you know, you, you've raised carbon capture and sequestration is a very important technology that we need to do more of and, and be able to, uh, to drive much larger benefit from. But can you also comment on where you see key uh, additional opportunities, perhaps in some of the the newer areas of focus that are being considered and, and addressed in Alberta at this point. Where would you hold up some you know, key priorities and opportunities for the province? Um, well, I, I, I've mentioned one that, that, I, that I think is really important, and I think it's a carbon capture store, the necessary part of, uh, of, uh, of, of a net zero aspiration. Um, I think the other areas that are important are, are, are to find a way to do lower carbon hydrogen. Today, um, you can create hydrogen, um, but it, uh, it's an emissions intense process. And there are, there's a lot of research and development that is going on. Some of that that we're doing through an, uh, uh, an innovation, a clean tech partnership that, that we have with Suncor um, that works with the clean tech industry on the West Coast. Um, to come up with, uh, to, to invest in promising technologies to try and get them off the lab bench 
and into the field and ultimately commercialize. So I think that's another one uh, that's very, very important. Um, and when I think about environmental and social governance, you know, broadly, I, I think it's also important, you know, our targets are around water use, our targets are around um, uh, land use, um, indigenous engagement's really, really important in Canada, it's never been more important, um, and, and carbon. But the one that gets all the attention is carbon. And when I look at what Alberta's capacity is, uh, inventions in the Alberta oil industry have made their way all, all around the world. I mean, one of the things that's really revolutionized the oil and gas industry is horizontal drilling. That was something that was a lot of pioneering work was done in the oil sands um, that made that possible. And our industry has always done a great job. Um, maybe it's because a lot of the work is done by service companies that a service company will, will pioneer a technology with one uh, company and then it will take it to another. Um, so I, I think all of that, that really, really helps. So you know, I, I look at, at hydrogen production um, and I look at carbon capture storage as the key ones. Um, and um, those are the ideas that invention, if you will, that I think are really, really important. And then it's how do you actually get someone to um, take it to the field, to pilot it? And then moreover, who's the first person that's going to risk capital uh, on it? And that's where you really need to bring together um, that energy policy and invention, if you're going to do that. And Alberta has a long history of that. If you look at the, if you look at the history of in situ oil sands, Alberta recognized a long time ago that, that you know, Canada has the third largest oil reserves. Well, about 95% of that's in the oil sands, maybe a little bit more. Um, and they had a problem, an 80-20 problem, where 20% of it they could figure out that they could mine it and they knew how to do that. And 80% of it was too deep to mine. And, and, and it was this tremendous advantage for Alberta that they didn't know how to, to get after. So what did they do? They, they stood up um, a Ostra, something um, that, that could be stood up again or something similar. And that really worked on the technology. They built an underground test facility and they worked really hard to make sure that they had a technology that would work. And then once they had the technology that would work, they put in place a fiscal system, a, a royalty regime that, that rewarded producers who used that technology so that they could, they could get their initial capital back. They did things like accelerated capital, capital cost allowance. And as the industry built up and, and, and became successful and, and the, uh, really made the technology work, then they started to withdraw those, those initial um, uh, types of fiscal incentives and, and today what you have is you have a, an oil sands industry that contributes to being the la fourth largest oil producer in the world. Um, and a good part of that comes from a technology that wasn't commercial 20 years ago. So, you know, we're on a journey um, that we're going to need, we're going to need time to do this. Um, and so uh, when I look at what's happened in the last 20 years with in situ technology, and I look at what can happen in the next 20 years with uh, carbon capture and storage and other low carbon technologies, I'm very encouraged. So some will say that we don't have the luxury of the time that we may have had historically, that we need to go faster and more aggressively uh, and our time is running out. How, how do you respond to that? Um, I, you know, I, I, I think the, the time for action is now. Um, but the, the whole issue that we're dealing with is, is a big societal issue. Um, and um, certainly when you look at where we are um, right now as a, as a society, as a country, um, we just increased our national debt um, significantly. Um, and then you, then you say, okay, we, we have a big bill to pay. Um, and I, and uh, you know, I, I don't think anyone, you know, people will pick around the edges around the way the governments have responded to this, but I think they've done the right things. Um, they responded to an imminent health crisis with some, with some pretty big measures that help people get through it. And now we've got to figure out how to pay that bill. And that's where you look to your large industries, um, the industries that have historically done that. And the oil and gas industry has been a big part of the financial 
fabric of this company, a country, sorry, and it, and it needs to continue to do that. Um, but I think there are policies that could be put in place today that would start to move things along. Um, and, uh, you know, the, the reality of the situation that we're in right now is, is that you're not going to see very many producers um, in our sector that are willing to take on additional debt right now. Um, we're all taking on debt as a, as a matter of just making sure we have liquidity um, to get through this crisis. We went through probably the biggest shock to oil prices. I've been in this industry for about 40 years, and um, that's the biggest shock to oil prices that I've ever seen. Um, but I, I do think that by putting in place policies today um, that create um, the, uh, the, you know, policy certainty is really, really important. So where are we going with carbon pricing? Where, uh, what are the, what are, where would we want to go as a country? And then how do we achieve that? Looking at the natural advantages that we have as a, as a country. And I think if you look at, at, at the way that, you, you know, I use the in situ well sands as one opportunity. Um, that resulted in, an, in a pretty vibrant industry inside of about 15 years. Um, and I do think that, that that's the kind of things that we're going to absolutely have to do if we want to, to move forward. So I think we can start today recognizing that we won't have the answer tomorrow, but we might have significant answers within the next few years. And, and that's the only way we're going to get at it, it is, is not by wondering what to do, but by starting down a road and course correcting as we go. So I, I know that we've got just a couple of minutes before we need to move into the Q&A. So, so what I'd like to do is, uh, is end this part of the session with um, a question related to the conversations that need to be had and, and the shared vision that, that you and I both referred to. The, the conversations that are being had, um, you know, it, to a certain extent, I think uh, one of the deficiencies from, from my perspective is this lack of kind of a shared rallying around what is it we're trying to achieve as a country. Where, where do you see the most significant, um, I guess, forging of new conversations, new relationships, bringing you know, a, a different combination of stakeholder into the conversations to, to be able to address, I think, this gap in, in a shared sense of where that momentum needs to be in spite of the uncertainties and in spite of the questions. To your point, you know, let's just get on with it. Uh, that's going to require, I think, a, a better understanding of how we're in this together and how we work together to move down that, that road of uncertainty. So, so what advice do you have or, or what would you like to see differently vis-a-vis -vis the stakeholders that are involved in, in trying to sort this out together? I, I think you, you have to ask yourself, um, first and foremost, I, I think you, so as a country, um, we have to have an economy um, and we have certain natural advantages that give us that economy. Um, so I think that that's where it starts. And, and when I look at when I look at Canada, what's Canada good at? Canada is particularly good at resource development, um, and has a you know, it, and is blessed with incredible natural resources. Not not just oil and gas, but but all kinds of other resources. So that that's an advantage that I don't think any country should look away from. The next question is 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 how do you do that as responsibly as possible, and how do you meet the challenge of climate change. Um, and so I, I, I think you don't start by looking away from what you're good at. I think if you look at um, uh, any energy demand forecast, um, seas, oil, and gas continuing to play a, 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 an integral part. Um, and I, I, you know, I, I refreshed myself last night on an uh, international energy agency paper that came out right at the start, right in January, I think it was released at the start of the World Economic Forum. And what it said is there is no solution to climate change without the participation of the oil and gas industry. The oil and gas industry has to play a meaningful part because what does the oil and gas industry know how to do? It knows how to do big capital projects. It knows how to innovate. Um, it knows how to implement um, technology in challenging environments. And so I, I think that the conversation that we need to have is you know, who are we as a country? 
what are you good at? I mean, a long time ago, someone said to me, um, uh, someone said to me, what do, what do you want to do? And as a young, like most young people, I had no idea. And they said, well, what are you good at? What do you like to do? Um, and I think as, as Canadians, we have to say, what are we good at? What do we like to do? What, what's our natural advantage? It's in the natural resource sector. And, and then how do we take advantage of that? What are the policies we want to put in place? And so it's, it's probably starts with that grounding as to where are we going to go as a country? And then what are the policies we're going to put in place that are going to allow us to enjoy the standard of life we have today and take that into the future and pass that on to the next generation? And how are we going to do that responsibly and meet our commitments for, for climate change? Um, and I think that's the way it has to start is, is, you know, what do we have to work with? And then how are we going to meet the outcomes we want? Okay, I see that Elizabeth has joined us. That's our cue to allow the Q&A now. So Elizabeth, over to you. Thanks, Kathy and Al, both uh, really, really great remarks. And, and yes, I would encourage folks to use the Q&A at the bottom of your screen to pose some questions, both for, for Kathy and for Al. Um, and, and I think I'll start, Al, you mentioned um, building from strengths uh, as a really important component for success and, and talked about Aostra. Uh, and so we do have a question about, you know, what, what was different and unique about Aostra that really allowed that particular technology to move forward? And is there anything that organizations like Emissions Reduction Alberta or, or Alberta Innovates can learn, uh, you know, from, from, um, from the success of, of Aostra? Um, yeah, I, I think Aostra was part of the, part of the answer. Um, and then, um, uh, the other part of it was, was so I, I asked her really focused on the technology. And then there was something that came along called the National Oil Sands Task Force. Um, and so I asked her was very, there was a sense of urgency around the technology. We have this tremendous advantage. We have no way to, to, to get it. How do we do that? So there was a sense of urgency around the technology. And then the National Oil Sands Task Force was pulled together at a time when the country was facing some dire economic circumstances. And what many people in Alberta forget is, is that the, the, the National Law Sense uh, uh, Task Force came together under a Liberal government. Um, and uh, it was uh, Mr. Martin and Mr. Gretchen um, that said, you know, we, we need the economic development that's going to come from this. Um, and there was a sense of urgency there and the policy positions and, that were taken and the policies that were put in place to incentivize industry to uh, commercialize the technology. So I, I, I think there was a sense of urgency on the technology front because Alberta recognized a tremendous opportunity. And there was also a, 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 a sense of urgency on the economic side because the federal government recognized a need and an opportunity. So I, I think that what we lack today is a sense of urgency. And at some point, I think we just have to commit to certain pathways that we're going to go down um, and, and get on with it. And I, I think probably the thing that's holding us back more today is, is there's lots of voices in the room about how we should do this and what we should do. But I, I think the most important thing we can do right now is have a sense of urgency as to how are we going to solve a, a, a problem that we have is that we have a, you know, we have an economy that, that isn't working right now. Um, we've incurred a lot of debt um, and we want to meet our climate change goals. How do you get all three? Um, and I think we have, need to have a sense of urgency around that and really focus on how we can have all three and kind of take some of the extraneous views, out, not views out of the room, but get rid of some of the noise and focus on what's important. So it goes to a great question uh, actually uh, for you, Kathy, uh, which is that um, folks would love to hear your views on, on how to bring people together effectively, how to hear from stakeholders, uh, from diverse voices and, and how to sort through some of that noise. I don't know if you have thoughts on that. Yeah, well, you know, one, one of the, um, I think, key uh, requirements that I think Al has articulated a couple of times this morning is this, this need for us to, to start um, articulating more definitively 
you know, what the key challenges are for the country. And let's agree on what those challenges are, what the opportunities are, and what that pa those pathways are going to look like. And, you know, and, until you can resonate around kind of a shared sense of, of what we're trying to accomplish here and the criticality of that, um, it, it's really hard to try to corral the, the, the viewpoints and, and the diversity of thought. And, and I'm not suggesting for a minute that we don't need that, that diversity to drive kind of the best outcomes, but, but we need a rallying point. We need to understand when we say things like, you know, Canada's committed to a net zero 2050, we can't just say that without being able to articulate what that means for us as a country and what those, those decision points and those choices need to look like and allow the conversations to acknowledge that there is a shared objective here. There, there are, you know, shared lists of what it is as a country we want to achieve together. Um, but, but we seem to be wandering kind of directionless um, unless we do have that sense of, of rallying and an opportunity for, for us to be able to identify where we do actually have convergence on the aspirations that the country has and our ability to actually execute on those. So I would suggest that the first, that the starting point is I think this critical need for us to identify where we do as a country agree uh, in terms of that vision and that path forward and put some specificity to that so that we can indeed roll up our sleeves and get on with it. Oh, well, that's excellent. So in terms of rolling up our sleeves, um, we, we do have a question uh, about, you know, particular types of um, whether they be federal or provincial financial incentives or, or otherwise that could be put in place. And Al, you mentioned 45Q uh, as, a, as an example in the U.S. Are there particular policies, Al, that you see um, that could be put in place, whether it be from other jurisdictions or, or that might be in play here in Canada that, that you would see as, as um, increasing investment, particularly in a time uh, that is so challenging um, in the face of, of the COVID pandemic? Uh, declining oil prices and, and the associated economic downturn. Any thoughts on that? Um, you know, 45Q is, is the one that comes to mind for carbon capture and storage. I, I think it's also, if you, look at, if you look at all of the different policies that are coming, so we've got a carbon tax that I think most people understand reasonably well. Um, and then the other thing that, that is being worked on right now is a clean fuel standard, um, which I think most people actually don't understand very well, um, including people in the industry, including me. I, I, I get briefed on it regularly to try and understand where it's going. And I think one of the things is, is that I, I think we have to say, look, if we're going to, if we're going to deal with this emissions challenge, you can't you know, you, you can't, you, you have all these policies, you have to be able to get credit for taking that emission out of the environment. Um, and not just under one policy, but under multiple policies. Make it as, as, as economically attractive for people to be doing that, and they will do it. And it's not, you know, this isn't subsidies, this isn't handouts. It's just recognizing that we're asking our industry to operate in a way that it hasn't operated before. So I think we've always had a, we've got a history of responsible development as a, as a Canadian oil industry. And that goes, that, that's the way we're regulated. That reflects the values of our country. But we need to turn it into a market environment that creates that incentive for people to do things. And we need to also expand our mind. I mean, one of the things that, that Alberta has is a tremendous advantage on um, for carbon capture and storage is a lot of depleted uh, gas reservoirs all over, the, all, over the, uh, all over Alberta and Saskatchewan and, and in parts of BC. Um, today, that might not Cap, that may need, might, might not qualify as permanent sequestration, but it, but it, but it could in the future. Um, and I know there's work being done on that. So I think that there's a, a number of different uh, things that need to go in place. But I think the biggest thing is is that if you want people to take, uh, if you want people to take the emissions challenge cert, uh, cert, uh, seriously, certainty of policy. What are we trying to achieve? And then create the incentives for people to be able to do that economically. Um, because the one thing I do worry about, and I did, I did uh, reference it in my opening remarks, was the competitiveness 
of our industry is that we need to continue to be competitive. And if we're not, um, if oil and gas uh, is going to continue to meet energy demand and we create an uncompetitive environment in Canada, we may not, we may slow down the industry or stop the industry in Canada, but we will still have oil and gas development going out elsewhere. It won't be subject to the same rules and regulations and reporting requirements that we have. Um, but it will continue to happen. We're dealing with a global challenge here. So in doing our part, we have to put in place a system that allows us to meet the commitments that we've made to the rest of the, to the world that says this is how we're going to do things in Canada. But we also have to create a market that is going to incentivize that. So follow on to that uh, question for you, Kathy, um, which is, so you sit in, a, in an important role as the CEO of the Canadian Institute for Climate Choices, and I know you came from a long career uh, in the financial industry, uh, most recently as CEO of the cooperators. You know, given the current circumstances um, and, and the need uh, to, to take some action, are there things in your mind um, that industry and government from a policy or a technology perspective can do in the very near term, uh, you know, in the next six months to a year, what would you see as uh, as priorities um, for 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 kickstarting uh, some of that action? Well, you know, my my sense is that we spend uh, to a certain extent wasted time on rhetoric, um, and and I think if we if we can commit to sitting around healthy tables of conversation. Um, and direct, um, you know, all of our energies to to sorting through what are the immediate priorities that this country is facing, uh, particularly post COVID recovery, um, and where those uh, areas of focus need to be need to be placed, um, and do that within the context of inclusive and positive uh, conversations associated with what truly is possible, and and who's accountable for what. Um, and, you know, who will be doing what, um, and, and, you know, I, I'll, I'll say this, you know, stop this, this um, I guess, unnecessary uh, waste of energy associated with, you know, kind of dancing around some pretty tough questions associated with where we see oil and gas in, in our future, what additional support mechanisms need to be provided to the industry, whether that's, you know, to Al's point that, you know, carbon capture is such a significant core uh, requirement and, and the ability to, to ensure that we are successfully moving that development capacity for the country forward. Well, then what does that look like and who, who are the players and who does what? Um, where do there have to be significant and substantive and perhaps different approaches to providing the financial opportunities that Al has been referring to. Um, but there are some serious questions that I don't think we have answered that relate to the overall future and the long-term future of energy uh, and where that's taking us globally and the, the continuing role, role of oil and gas. And I think we need to have and, uh, candid and honest conversations that do rally us around a shared vision for um, not only oil and gas's future, but how it's contexted with the new energy developments that the countries around the world are, are um, turning their attention and, and the momentum is growing associated with the role that those alternative energies are going to play in future. And, and I think that's where we start to get defensive in our, in our conversations. I think we need open, candid, very focused conversations related to the positioning of this country vis-a-vis -vis energy, not only oil and gas, but the broader context of energy and the, the natural capacity that the country has to play in that broader context. I think there, there's a sense of competing interest now. You know, if we, if, we, if we allocate too much of our energy, our time, our money, our finances, our support to figuring out how best to, to provide a sustainable future for oil and gas, we're taking that away from the opportunities for the country to, to really invest significantly and seriously in positioning ourselves competitively in um, opportunities for alternatives. And, and it's not an either or. I mean, we, we need to put all of that on the table and have these candid conversations. And I think, you know, as I said earlier, 
You know, unless and until there is a better meeting of the minds in the short term, I think we're going to be taking a piecemeal approach. And I think we're going to lose opportunity as a country, <clears throat> excuse me, not only to continue to ensure, um, I think, the, uh, the leadership that we played historically and the significant role that the oil and gas industry needs to continue to play, um, but that we also position ourselves competitively to ensure that we're leveraging the additional capacity that the country has to offer in playing a leadership role in the broader energy context. Yeah, I, th I think it's important to, to recognize that, is that as the world population continues to grow, we're, we'll need all forms of energy. Absolutely. Uh, and and um, uh, it's certainly when I, when, I, when I reference the support for oil and gas, um, oil and gas will continue to meet part of the energy demand, but you are seeing other forms of energy um, that I, I still think there's a long way to go uh, for, for uh, those energy sources to be competitive um, and to be reliable the way that, uh, that people expect energy. Um, but the world wants more energy and they want less carbon emissions. So um, we have to figure out how to do both. And, and it's yeah. not just an oil and gas answer. There are other forms of energy that, that you have to, you have to get better and get more reliable and, and, and be available. And a few questions. Oh, sorry, Kathy, please. Sorry, well, just, just to emphasize the point, um, let's not shut out that broader conversation. So, you know, we, we need to recognize that, that all of these solutions are required and we have a, play, a, a role to play as a country. And so let's not get defensive and shut each other out as we start to, to contemplate how all of that needs to play together. <clears throat> I'm sorry, I'm, I'm hoarse. <laughs> It's an exciting conversation. <laughs> um, a few questions coming in uh, related to um, the, the notion that, that North Canadians and, and the world more broadly isn't aware of, of the good things that are happening in Alberta and or isn't engaged in the conversation uh, and doesn't have the information to understand the role that oil and gas can play. Um, uh, and so probably to both of you, but Al, maybe starting with you, how, how could we better educate Canadians in terms of the role oil and gas plays, what the future looks like? How can we um, better reach the world uh, to help them understand um, some of these exciting technology opportunities that Alberta's playing a leadership role in, uh, carbon capture use and storage, the potential around hydrogen? Um, what are the right forums and the right mechanisms um, to, to, to do that broader education? That's a really good question. I'm not sure that I that I have the answer, but I, I would say um, I think you know. So I I've spent a lot of uh, a lot of I do a lot of different things in my role, and and I would say um, on the ESG topic, I probably spent about 20% of my time on this three years ago, and I spend over 80% of my time on it now, and I and I've talked to people from all over the world on it. Um, and I would say probably the biggest thing is that, is that uh, the way that energy is produced, um, regulated, reported on, the, the, the whole framework, the legislative and regulatory framework in Canada is really, really misunderstood. Um, the oil sands are, um, have seemed to have become a lightning rod. Um, but if you look at the oil sands, I mean, particularly in situ technology is less than 20 years old. The first, uh, the first commercial SAGD project came on in mid-2001. Um, and um, if you look at the trajectory of emissions that, that have come on, uh, the trajectory on emissions since that time, emissions intensity has dropped significantly. Um, as the technology has gotten better. And it's not just Synovus. We've, 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 since 2004, we've reduced our emissions intensity by 30%, but other producers have done similar things. Um, so it, 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 it is an industry that I think is very misunderstood. The other thing that I, I find particularly vexing um, is this whole idea of comparing emissions intensity across different streams of crude oil. Um, uh, and, um, Anyone that's looked into it will tell you that in most of the world, you can't get the data to accurately do that. So it's based on model data. The one thing in Canada and in particularly in Alberta is that we're, we all report that. That, that, 
that is is broadly available. So I think it 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 starts with you know educating people on the resource where it's located, um, the challenges in, in getting to the resource, um, and then the you know the progress that has been made. And also the expectations that we have as a society, you know, industry will say, well, we're regulated in this way. We're regulated in that way because that's what Canadians expect. That's what Albertans expect. Um, and um, I think when you explain that to people, they're always very surprised. They're very surprised that we actually have the data that we do. And when I look at some of the decisions that have been made internationally, um, and you sit down and you talk to those people, they aren't even aware that you can get better data than you can model in Alberta and you can't get it elsewhere in the world. Um, they aren't aware of, of, of a lot of the things that Albertans, that Alberta does and, and, and Canada does. So I think there's, there's a broad education uh, that needs to happen on the way that we, what the resource is, how we develop it and how we're expected to develop it from our national and, and regional governments. Thanks. Maybe um, I'll pose one more question uh, from the QA uh, before I uh, invite you both to just provide some closing remarks. We're coming up on 10 o'clock when the breakouts will begin. And uh, it's come in through the QA um, and I'm happy that it has because it is a little self-serving, <laughs> which is, you know, what are, what is the role that organizations like the University of Calgary, the School of Public Policy, the School of Business, um, Emissions Reduction Alberta as a funder, what are the roles that organizations like ours can play uh, in, in moving towards some of these solutions? Had a question around things like pathways, modeling, uh, and study work that might come out of uh, some of the academic and post-secondary institutions for ERA uh, offering funding. Um, maybe Kathy would start, could start with you. What's the importance of organizations like ours? Well, I, I, you know, I think I would start by um, suggesting that to Al's point about the lack of understanding <clears throat> and, um, <clears throat> excuse me, I don't know if I'm going to be able to continue to, to speak, um, that, that there is really, uh, you know, a, a, a gap in understanding and, and unfortunately that exists with some pretty critically important stakeholders for the country and for the energy industry in the country. Um, and you've got to ask yourself why, what, what, what's missing? Why is there that lack of understanding or, you know, they're not getting the, uh, the access to the data that we think would be more helpful. Um, and, and that leads me back to, to somewhat answering your question. And that is that we've got, we've got significant um, opportunity. We've got the leverage of a very skilled and innovative um, ecosystem of players. Um, and many of them that you've, you've mentioned, particularly in, in Alberta, um, and so what is it that these institutions working together and identifying what they are best able to provide, what role can we play to ensure that we're having the candid conversations, putting accurate information on the table and taking responsibility to ensure that we disseminate that information to the most important stakeholders. And I think the institutions in the province all play uh, individual and unique roles in, in either providing that accurate information and, and um, managing the initiatives associated with driving out the story. Um, but other aspects of that institutional ecosystem in the province is also very well positioned to actually carry the message and to increase our efforts associated with ensuring that the messaging is getting out to the critical stakeholders. So I think there's a, you know, there's a reflection to be, to be had in terms of you know, what is working, what isn't working, to Al's point related to, you know, that the, the compelling story, including what isn't working that we are prepared to share with the world and ensure that the respective unique strengths of the institutions and that ecosystem are being brought to bear um, in sharing that message. Al, thoughts on the role of organizations like ours? Well, I, I think there's a, a really uh, important <laughs> educational perspective, particularly at the university level. Um, I think energy literacy is, is something that is really lacking um, right across the country, including in Alberta. Um, but I, I do think it's really, really important where our energy comes from, where could it come from, how reliable is it today. I have a you know personal story. I have a daughter that's moved to Ontario in the last five years and 
um, has started a family there. So um, she's going to live in Ontario. And when I go to Ontario and talk to people about energy, they completely misunderstand oil and gas. Uh, completely, um, you, you know, there, there's a lot of views about what can be achieved in the timeline it can be achieved in. Um, where energy comes from, how it's important to the national economy, how it's important to the regional economy, um, the choices that have to be made. I think those are the kinds of things that, that organizations like ERA and, and, and the universities, not just the University of Calgary, but other universities as well, play a critical role in and, and, and dipped in reality. Um, where we live, we, we live in a cold climate. We live in a climate in Alberta where renewables don't always work. Um, so that means to me, that doesn't just say, well, that means we shouldn't do any more renewables. I think it says we need to make renewables better and we need to have backup um, for when they don't work because all of us expect, you know, when we, when we flick the light switch or plug in something in a socket, we expect that to work. Um, we expect to be able to heat our homes in the winter and, 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 and move our kids around to music lessons and, and, and school and things like that. So how do we do all of that? And I think that there's a, there's a real vacuum in the way people understand energy, where it comes from and where we need to go with it in the future if we're going to meet the, the, the dual goal of meeting that growing energy demand and solving the emissions challenge. Excellent. Thanks, Al. So we have just about four minutes left uh, before the top of the hour. Um, I'd love to invite each of you just to give a minute or two of, of closing remarks. And in particular, as we're moving into the breakout sessions, some of what we'll be talking about is what can I do, you know, based on what I've heard this morning, um, what are the actions I as an individual with my team at work, with my family, with my organization, um, what steps might I take as I, as I go away from this conversation? Um, so uh, I'll invite, start with Kathy and then go to Al, uh, just again, a minute or two closing remarks and, and any inspiration in terms of, um, of a call to action and, and what, what uh, folks listening this morning could take away. Hopefully my voice will hold up for me for another two minutes. Um, and I apologize folks for the, uh, the scratchiness. Um, so I, you know, I, I would leave the group with this, with this perspective. Um, I, you know, I, I come from um, an industry where I have had uh, the opportunity to watch and to participate in uh, implications of climate and the changing climate around the world and, and the challenges that that's creating for communities. I think we share that concern as a country. I think Canadians do rally around, um, you know, the, the, the sense that, that we do want to ensure a prosperous, a healthy, a safe um, country for our children and our grandchildren. And we do know that, that part of that requirement is that the world needs to, to continue on this decarbonization journey. But it's a complex journey. It's a journey with an awful lot of questions still, a lot of uncertainty, and the need for all of us to take responsibility, both individually and within the, the context of the, of the institutions and the, and the organizations and the communities that we are part of, to sort through how best to contribute to being able to bring clarity to that confusion and that complexity. We all can play a role, we all should play a role because you know, the stakes are significant. We want to be prosperous, we wanna leave a country that's prosperous for future generations. And, and I think you know, when all is said and done, we do sit around these, these tables of dialogue, we share an awful lot of, of where we want to take this country. Our differences are far fewer than our similarities. And so I would really encourage us to identify how best we can contribute, not only as individuals, but as members of institutions and communities and organizations that absolutely should and need to play a role in contributing to a prosperous future for the country. Thanks, Kathy. Al, over to you. Final thoughts. Um, you know, I, I, I think, you know, I, I touched on it when you asked what, what's the role of, of of groups like the ones that have sponsored this is, I think there needs to be, a, there needs to be a, a conversation about where we want to go as a country and how we want to solve the, the 
the dual challenge that we have. And, and, and to me, that's continued economic prosperity. We're lucky to live in a, in a country that, that has a really high standard of living and, and, and a lot of advantages that people don't enjoy in other, in other countries. So how do we do that? And at the same time, deal with the growing concern over emissions. And I think it's a, it's a conversation that has to realize that this is not something that's going to happen tomorrow. Um, it was a long-term journey to get us where we are today, and it's going to be a long-term journey um, that, that takes us to where we all want to go to, to, to tomorrow. And so what are the steps that we have to start taking today? And I think it has to start with a conversation grounded in reality. I think it has to start with a conversation that looks at our natural advantages as a country. And I think of one of our natural advantages as a country is not just that we're blessed with a lot of natural resources, but we're also blessed with a, with a system that uh, allows people to um, develop um, the best of themselves and the best of our industries. And how do we do that in a way that meets the two goals that we that we really have. So I, I think it's a conversation that has to start grounded in reality of, of who we are and where we wanna go and what's important in the country. Um, and, and has to be, I, I, it can't be partisan um, because I think all, everyone wants a better future and, and what does that future look like? Um, and it, it, it probably needs to be less of us and them and more of we, how are we going to do this? So. I think that's where it starts. Thank you so much, uh, both Kathy and Al, for spending an hour of your day with us. Uh, I know you're both extremely busy people and leaders uh, of your organizations, organizations that are critical to the success and meeting the goals that we've set for ourselves. Um, I want to remind everyone this is the first of three sessions uh, that we'll be hosting, uh, talking about Alberta's role in, role in a low carbon energy future. And so please, if you haven't already, register for the next two sessions.